In this episode of our workshop series in the life and works of Jose Rizal, let us get to know more about the national hero and the significant people involved in his life, as well as his journey to Europe, the organizations he was involved in, and the various events that led to his eventual martyrdom. This is Profiling the Hero. Jose Protasio Rizal Mercado y Alonso Rialonda was born on June 19, 1861 in Calamba in the province of La Laguna to parents Teodora Morales Alonso Rialonda y Quintos and Francisco Ingracio Rizal Mercado y Alejandro. Rizal was born at a time when the Philippines was still under the rule of Spain. During this time, Spanish friars, the elements of stability and continuity in the colony, had the authority over religious and administrative matters, as well as the education in the Philippines. They acted as the representatives of Spain to uphold the authority of the mother country. Spanish officials, who were highly corrupt, incompetent, and cruel, and acted with arrogance and superiority, depended on the advice and assistance of the Spanish friars. Meanwhile, the Filipinos were under a feudalistic relationship with the Spaniards, with nearly all land of any value was owned by the religious order. The auspicious Filipinos became cronies, with their lifestyles patterned to that of the Spaniards. They prospered through the judicious use of their new office, influence, and connections, acquiring exclusive title to lands formerly held in common, lending money with the authority of the new regime to enforce the old usurious rates of interest, and sending their children to school to acquire new knowledge. Still, the Declaration of Equality Among All Men Born in Spanish Territory only applies to those with white skin. Thus, when the local headmen failed to collect the tribute assigned to their communities and were obliged to make up the difference, even with their connections to the Spaniards, they were sometimes ruined. Overall, a widening and deepening gap between the rich and the poor, the learned and the unlettered, the active and the passively resigned, the beaters and the beaten were observed. As stated earlier, Filipinos were under a feudalistic relationship with the Spaniards. Don Francisco himself was a tenant farmer in a Dominican-owned hacienda in Calamba. Meanwhile, Doña Teodora was a shop owner in town. The Rizal family belonged to the Principalia. Don Francisco and Doña Teodora themselves both came from a lineage of people with substance and influence well above the average. They were illustrados, or educated. Rizal was obviously brought up in circumstances that we can call privilege even today. He had an ayah or personal servant and private tutor when he was young, and he and his siblings were also sent to colleges in Manila. But then again, their fortunes were entirely dependent on the Dominican friars. In fact, their class is not equal to those in Europe. Don Francisco and Doña Teodora were blessed with 11 children, two boys and nine girls. They had Saturnina on 1850, the eldest, Pasiano on 1851, Narcisa on 1852, Olympia on 1855, Lucia on 1857, Maria on 1859, Jose on 1861, Concepcion on 1862, Josefa on 1865, Trinidad on 1868, and Soledad on 1870, the youngest. Jose Rizal was the seventh of the eleven children, the younger of the two boys. Concepcion, who was closest to Rizal in age, died young and it was said that she was Rizal's first sorrow. Rizal, however, was cordial to all his sisters. Meanwhile, Pasiano, with her 10-year age gap, was like a second father to him. Doña Teodora was Jose Rizal's first teacher. 
She was the one who discovered Rizal's talent for poetry and encouraged him to write poems. She also told him various stories like the fable of the young Muth and the old one to develop his son's imagination. At the age of three, Jose Rizal already memorized the alphabet and learned several prayers in Spanish before he was five. Jose Rizal therefore grew up with the advantage of a bilingual background with Tagalog as his common speech and being fairly familiar with Spanish because of his mother. When Jose Rizal grew older, his parents hired private tutors such as Maestro Celestino and Maestro Lucas Padua to teach their son at home. Leon Monroy, a former schoolmate of Don Francisco, also became one of Rizal's tutors. Monroy resided in the Rizal residence and taught the young Jose about the first steps in Latin. However, when Monroy died, Doña Chodora and Don Francisco decided to enroll Jose Rizal in a traditional village school in Binyan. He was nine years old when he left Calamba for Binyan with his older brother, Pasiano, who brought him to the house and school at the same time of Maestro Justiniano Aquino Cruz, who knew Latin and Spanish grammar by heart, according to Jose Rizal. Maestro Justiniano Cruz was also Pasiano's teacher before. The maestro practiced the traditional way of teaching common during this time, which is to transmit knowledge by way of whippings and blows. Rizal, despite his reputation of being a good boy, shared that he usually was called to receive five or six blows on the hand. When Jose Rizal was 11 years old, he had his formal basic education at Ateneo Municipal in Manila. He used their other family name Rizal when he entered Ateneo to avoid suspicion because his brother Pasiano used Mercado as his surname when studying and working with Padre Burgos. Rizal would have not been admitted to Ateneo because Father Magin Fernando was unwilling to admit him for two reasons. First, he came late. And second, he seemed weak and was very small for his age. It was when Dr. Manuel Sarces Burgos intervened and Rizal was then admitted. Despite Rizal's familiarity with the Spanish language, he still struggled in mastering certain syllables. One of his teachers in Ateneo, Father Francisco Sanchez, encouraged and guided him to study hard and write poetry. According to Father Sanchez, although Rizal struggled to speak Spanish, was nonetheless able to learn Spanish and write fair compositions. Jose Rizal even took private classes at Santa Isabel College to improve his Spanish. Throughout his entire course, Jose Rizal won several prizes and awards. One of these is a single contest offered by the Liceo Artístico Literario in honor of Spain's greatest writer Cervantes held in Manila in 1880. The winner of the competition will receive a gold ring as first prize and a diploma of merit granted by the Economic Society of the Friends of the Country. All the Spanish judges in the competition favored Rizal's allegory, the Councils of the Gods or El Consejo de los Dioses, but when they found out that the winner of the competition is a Filipino, an objection was raised regarding the giving of first prize to a Filipino considering that there were prominent Spaniards who also joined the contest. Nonetheless, Rizal earned his Bachelor of Arts degree with highest honors from the Ateneo on March 23, 1876 and matriculated at the University of Santo Tomas in April 1877. He initially enrolled and studied philosophy and letters in Santo Tomas because he was not yet certain about what career path he would choose. He then enrolled in the preparatory medical course when he became interested in becoming a physician so he could treat his mother's failing eyesight. Also, Father Pablo Ramon, the rector of Ateneo, eventually responded to Jose Rizal's letter and advised him to take medicine. Rizal also studied agriculture in Ateneo, besides specializing in medicine, and earned the degree of land surveyor and agricultural expert. However, Rizal did not enjoy his education at Santo Tomas because of the hostility of the Dominican teachers, the racial discrimination against Filipino students, and the outdated and authoritarian manner of teaching. Furthermore, he also deeply resented how local civil guard maltreated any of the poor farmers. In 1880, Rizal experienced this rough treatment by the civil guard. Rizal passed a lieutenant of the civil guard in the dark one night, not knowing who it was. Without saying a thing, the lieutenant whacked him with his word, wounding Rizal. 
Rizal later headed to the palace of Governor General Fernando Primo de Rivera to seek justice. However, he failed to achieve the justice he demanded and did not even see the Governor General. Brutality and any acts of violence were rampant during this time, particularly done by the Guardia Civil, beating and harming villagers who did not even commit any offense. Rizal also specifically mentioned that the officers were supposed to protect people and keep the public in peace were actually the ones breaking the law. The incident left a deep impression on Rizal. As someone who is aware of his dignity and ability to compete on equal terms with the Spaniard, he discovered that as an Indio, he was not accorded equality before the bar of justice. This deep sense of Filipino dignity, as well as the refusal to tolerate injustice, appears to have played a role in his decision to break off his studies at the University of Santo Tomas and leave the Philippines for Europe. His studies in Europe were viewed by Rizal and Pasiano as a means of completing a patriotic purpose or preparing himself to do something for his nation. As a man of curiosity with a penchant for learning, Jose Rizal decided to continue his studies in Europe, particularly Madrid, Spain in 1882. On his journey to Europe, Rizal boarded the Spanish vessel Salvadora to Singapore. He then embarked a French ship, Jena, passing through the Suez Canal to Marseille, France, then took a train to Barcelona before he left for Madrid. He stayed in Europe for five years prior to returning to the Philippines in 1887. Russell and Rodriguez wrote, On August 5, 1887, after five years of wanderings and so many triumphs, he, Rizal, saw once more the green tide of the Pasig. The true purpose of Rizal's voyage to Europe, however, was kept as a secret. On one hand, the commonly held reason for his departure was to study at Universidad Central de Madrid and ultimately augment his knowledge and skills in the field of medicine. This was also the reason known to their friends, acquaintances, and strangers in their town and neighboring towns, as expressed by Pasiano in his letter to Rizal in May 26, 1882. Guerrero also posited that Rizal's disappointment in the university, which failed to perceive his creative and intelligent writings and fell deaf to the political implications of his work, pushed him to study abroad. On the other hand, there seemed to be a greater purpose or greater inclination behind Rizal's journey to Europe, which would serve not just himself but also his fellow countrymen and motherland, based on the same letter from Pasiano to Rizal. Vicente Helia's letter to Rizal in June 30, 1882, likewise expressed the same sentiment that Rizal is doing something good for his countrymen, which was part of his plan. However, words such as greater inclination, good for countrymen, plans, and etc. remain cryptic. Nevertheless, Cotes expounded on this by clearly stating that the first step to reform is to advance one's knowledge, Hence, compelling Rizal to further his studies abroad in order to learn in the widest possible sense about other nations. Guerrero, Cotes, Russell and Rodriguez, and Craig were also in agreement with one another in identifying state-led attacks and repression as among the major factors that bolstered Rizal's decision to study in Europe, particularly Madrid. Jose Rizal's endeavor abroad was supported by his brother Pasiano, who kept Rizal's undertaking discreet to Spanish authorities, friars, and even to their parents. Pasiano also provided his younger brother with money for the trip. One of the reasons for this was that Borgos was a strong advocate for Filipinos to study abroad so as to learn more about reforms and how to forward them better. It would then not be surprising that Pasiano, who is Borgo's friend and student, also felt the same. It was undeniable that the education system in the Philippines, established by the Spanish colonizers, was repressive and merely treats Filipinos as inferiors to the Spaniards. And as someone with a critical mind, such a repressive education system limits Rizal from realizing his true potential as well as from honing further his skills and talents. The prevailing socio-political condition of the time then attempted to keep Filipinos stupid, 
through its colonial, repressive, and inaccessible education system, among others, which does not only affect Filipino students, but also Filipino priests, as we shall see later in the case of Gomborza. Rizal was 20 years old when he went to Spain, and 10 years prior, the execution of the three secular priests, namely Mariano Gomez, Jose Borgos, and Jacinto Zamora, or commonly known as Gomborza, happened, which in a way aroused Jose Rizal's political consciousness at the age of 10. As described by Guerrero, Mariano Gomez was a native of Cavite, born half Chinese. He was under the watch of the Spanish government but received leniency due to his old age. Jose Borgos was a Spanish born in the Philippines and a parish priest in Manila Cathedral, described as modest yet with immense passion in terms of his political stance, example nationalism and secularism. Lastly, Jacinto Zamora was also a Spanish born in the Philippines and was said to be a troublesome character due to his indifference towards Spaniards. According to John Schumacher, there are several accounts of the 1872 Cavite mutiny with differing interpretations. Hence, there is a need to cross-reference these accounts. For Montero, the Cavite mutiny was part of a larger anti-Spaniard and anti-friar revolt instigated by the Gomborza and other lay people and clerics. His account also underpins his hostility towards Reformation and nationalist movements. Meanwhile, Plashu's account counters that of Montero in such a way that he claims the innocence of the three martyred priests and expresses that the Filipinos who gathered in Bagumbayan during the execution acclaimed the Gomborza as quote-unquote, those who were going to die for having dreamed of independence for their country. Regidor, on the other hand, asserted that the Cavite mutiny was exploited by some Spaniards and friars in order to quell Filipino liberal reformist aspirations. Contrary also to Montero's account, Pardo did not see the Cavite mutiny as a movement to topple Spanish rule but merely as an uprising of dissatisfied arsenal workers and other Filipino troops in Cavite naval yard arising from their experiences of forced labor and the privation of exemption from tax. This, however, was associated with reformist ambition and viewed as a threat to Spanish sovereignty, leading to the unjust imprisonment and punishment of the Filipino people, including the three secular priests and other mutineers. Mariano Gomez, Jose Borgos, and Jacinto Zamora were arrested on the order of Governor General Rafael Esquerdo. They were charged with treason by the Spanish court martial as the alleged instigators of the 1872 Cavite mutiny and were sentenced to death. This sentence was forwarded by the Governor General to the Archbishop for canonical penalty of degradation, and despite the refusal of the Archbishop, Esquerdo proceeded to publicly execute the three martyred priests by Garote. What transpired in 1872 resulted in a policy change in which the Spanish government attempted to blot out every access by Filipino priests to a higher education, as it decreed in 1872 that a doctoral program in the university be closed to Filipinos, for it was from the university that those priests sent to death or exile had come. Nevertheless, the execution of Gomborza prompted or sparked nationalist aspirations among Filipinos, including Rizal. When Rizal arrived in Madrid, he became associated with fellow Filipinos, which include Don Pedro Alejandro Paterno, Gregorio Sanchanco, Graciano Lopez Jaina, Juan Luna, Milesio Figueroa, Felix Rizzo Roshon Hidalgo, Miguel Zaragoza, and Esteban Villanueva. Eventually, he would become associated with Marcelo Hilario del Pilar, who would become both his greatest ally and rival. By early 1882, the Filipino colony in Madrid founded the Circulo Hispano-Filipino. The organization promised to be nothing more than the faithful reflection in Madrid of the public life of those distant Spanish lands where the unique and absolute party, banner, or political aspiration is to see exalted in all parts of the world the glorious name of the fatherland. The Circulo would produce a bi-weekly newspaper called Revista del Circulo Hispano-Filipino on October 29, 1882. By early 1883, the newspaper and the organization would die due to the withdrawal of support from older members and lack of funding. 
a new organization, the Asociación Hispano-Filipino, was also planned toward the middle of 1888. This organization was to be composed of a group of Filipinos and a few peninsular Spaniards sympathetic to its aspiration to work for the material and moral improvement of the Philippine archipelago. Graciano Lopez Haina and Marcelo H. Del Pilar would, along with the Cerizal, be recognized in posterity as a triumvirate of the propaganda movement. Lopez Haina was an excellent orator despite the slight stutter that littered his heavy Bisaya accent and was a trenchant journalist. His writings were described as bombastic and he was described as passionate not only in his defenses of the Filipinos but in his open attacks both on friars and peninsular officials. Del Pilar, on the other hand, was a prototype of the modern politician, lawyer, newspaper man, and civic leader. He was known for his skillful and efficient use of mass methods for propaganda, modern concept of political activity, and belief in organization, skillful in spreading nationalist and anti-friar ideas to stir up resentment against existing conditions. In 1882, Del Pilar was a member of the group which founded the first bilingual newspaper in the Philippines, the Jaryong Tagalog. On February 15, 1889, a new association of Filipino expatriates in Spain began the publication of La Solidaridad, which was a fortnightly organ of Philippine opinion. In its first article, Nuestros Propositos, it defined its program as follows, to combat all reaction, to impede all retrogression, to applaud and accept every liberal idea, to defend all progress. In a word, one more a propagandist of all the ideals of democracy, aspiring to make democracy prevail in all the peoples both of the peninsula and of the overseas provinces. The Triumvirate led the propaganda movement, which is a movement from the late 19th century which sought for political reforms for the Philippines. The movement called for freedom of the press, greater representation in the Cortes, equal rights under the law for peninsular Spaniards and Spanish subjects in the Philippines to justify the move for assimilation into Spain. Rizal enrolled in two courses at the Universidad Central de Madrid, which are medicine and philosophy and letters. According to Guerrero, Rizal actually did not get his doctorate in medicine, thus Rizal was never really Dr. Rizal. Rizal had to make do with an allowance of 50 pesos per month while he was abroad. Sometimes the letters of credit would arrive late, sometimes not at all. The rates of exchange for the Spanish peseta were also high, which would cause Rizal and his family to lose too much money. In November 1884, Pashana told Rizal that they had lost 3,000 pesos on their capital and that the family had a debt of 4,000 pesos because of new machinery for their farm. When he was just a child, Doña Chudora was in prison. According to Craig, the narrative goes back to the attempted revenge of a lieutenant of the Guardia Civil, who every time he visited town from his station in Binyan, had the habit of having his horse fed by the generosity of the mercados at their home. However, once there was a shortage of food for the cattle and horses, the mercados insisted on caring for their own animals before they could offer their hospitality to others. This earned the ire of the lieutenant. When Doña Chidora tried to help reconcile her brother Jose Alberto and his adulterer wife, her sister-in-law became mad at her meddling and accused her of being her brother's accomplice in attempting to poison her. If the claim of attempted murder was properly investigated, it would have been unfounded, but with the help of the officer who had a grudge against them, Doña Lola was wrongly imprisoned for two years. Moreover, the judge that was assigned to the case also thought that he did not receive the proper attention his dignity demanded from the Mercado family, so in retaliation, he ordered that Doña Chidora be immediately locked up at the provincial prison. While abroad, Rizal would meet his closest friend, Professor Ferdinand Blumentritt. Rizal and he would become acquainted when he was 33 years old when Rizal sent him a letter after hearing in Heidelberg that an Austrian scholar was learning Tagalog and had also published some works about Tagalog. Rizal would send him a book written in both Tagalog and Spanish about arithmetic, a gesture which Blumentritt would return by sending him two books. Although the beginning of their friendship was grounded on their shared love of science and Filipiniana, Blumentritt eventually became Rizal's closest confidant, a father figure, advisor, defender, and admirer. Rizal's love and relationship with women are often topics of discussion alongside his love for his country. The following are the recorded affairs and relationships Rizal has had. Segunda Katibak Segunda was a sister of Rizal's former schoolmate and friend, Mariano Katigbak. While visiting a house at Trozo, which belonged to Rizal's grandmother, who was a friend of Mariano's father, Rizal met the 14-year-old Segunda. Rizal was able to have the opportunity to meet her outside of the usual Sunday meetings when his sister, Olympia, enrolled in the Colegio de la Concordia and became friends and shared a dorm with Segunda. However, their courtship or flirtation was cut short when Segunda was sent back home. Leonor Valenzuela, also known as Orang, the two exchanged correspondence and Rizal wrote her letters written in invisible ink. Even when he was already in Madrid, Rizal encouraged and fueled her hopes on their relationship through his friend Changoy Cecilio. Leonor Rivera was Rizal's close cousin. When he was on vacation, the two wrote letters to each other in code wherein Leonor signed with the name Tainis. According to Craig, only some of the earliest letters that Rizal sent in his first years in Europe reached Leonor, and because her mother was advised against her daughter's relationship with Rizal, she gradually withheld more and more of the letters from both parties until they eventually stopped. 
During his time in Madrid, his weekly visit to the residence of Don Pablo Ortiga Iri, a liberal Spaniard who used to be the mayor of Manila during General de la Torre's reign, was a fixture of Rizal's social life. It was in these weekly visits that the Filipino students gathered within Don Pablo's home were entertained by his daughter Consuelo, who caught Rizal's eye and motivated him to continue continue with these weekly visits. Rizal would dedicate some verses to her entitled A la Senorita C-O-E-R. Rizal courted her, however, she eventually chose a Spanish born in the Philippines, Eduardo de Lete, over him. Seiko Usui, or Osei San, was the daughter of a samurai whom Rizal met in one of her afternoon walks. Although there are not many accounts on their short-lived romance, Rizal had written that Miss Seiko had loved him as no woman had ever done before. During one of Rizal's travels around Europe, he had his lodgings at number 37, Shalcott Crescent, in the house of the Beckett family. The Beckett family had four daughters and two sons, and the daughters were called Gertrude or Totti, Blanche or Sissy, Flory and Grace. The eldest daughter took care of him and brought him breakfast in the mornings, made him English tea in the evenings, and helped him prepare materials for his art. Correspondence between the two of them suggests that the two were likely more than friends. While staying in Biarritz, France, particularly in a villa owned by the Bustids, Rizal befriended the two Bustid sisters, Nelly and Adelina. As stated by Guerrero, there seemed to be a debate as to who among the two sisters caught the attention of Rizal. The only certain thing was that Antonio Luna, his compatriot, was head over heels for Nelly. Thus, the infamous love triangle unfolded. Jose Rizal discreetly left Paris for Madrid in 1890 and lodged at a boarding house managed by the two Jacobi sisters. According to Guerrero, historical gossip indicates that Rizal and Susan Jacobi had a short-lived relationship based on an undated letter written by Susan herself. Rizal met his last love, Josephine Bracken, when she accompanied her adoptive father, George Taufer, to a checkup for his blindness. They sought the help of Dr. Jose Rizal and they eventually fell in love. The two announced their intention to marry within a month, however, no priest would officiate their wedding. Despite Taufer's initial opposition, Josephine was able to come live with Rizal, whom she fondly called Joe, and lived with him in the Pitan. After staying in Europe, Rizal was compelled to return to the Philippines in 1892 due to the agrarian dispute in Calamba that led to his family's financial difficulties. He also wanted to fulfill his duties and mission in his homeland. Before he came back to the Philippines, Jose Rizal stayed over in Hong Kong in 1891. Then, Don Francisco, Pasiano, and his brother-in-law, Silvestre Obaldo, came over as they fled from Manila. Doña Teodora, on the other hand, once again suffered from the hands of the Spanish authorities but for a different reason, that is, the falsification of Cedula and styling herself as Alonso. Doña Teodora had cataracts and she was almost completely blind at that time. When she was released and permitted to leave the country, she and her daughters, Lucia, Josefa, and Trinidad, went to Hong Kong in 1892 and Rizal operated on her right eye. Jose Rizal then returned to the Philippines in June the same year. In the last quarter of the 19th century, the Middle Ages were coming to an end in the Philippines. At this time, anomalies of the Spanish rule such as its ruthless persecution and inefficient security and administration were now being exposed and revolutions were brewing. Rizal desired to preserve the Spanish sovereignty in the Philippines, but he also desired to bring about reforms and conditions conducive to advancement. On July 3, 1892, upon his return to the Philippines, Rizal founded La Liga Filipina or the Philippine League in Tundo, Manila, which is an association that sought to unite all Filipinos of good character for concerted action toward the economic advancement of their country, for a higher standard of manhood, and to assure opportunities for education and development to talented Filipino youth. The League specifically aimed to unite the whole archipelago into one compact and homogeneous body, mutually protect every want and necessity, defend against all violence and injustice, encourage education, agriculture, and commerce, and study and apply reforms. The first set of officers elected were Ambrosio Salvador as president, Diodato Arellano as the secretary, Bonifacio Arevalo as treasurer, and Agustin de la Rosa as fiscal. After learning that a revolution had broken out and that there was a raging yellow fever epidemic and physicians to meet the needs of the Spanish troops were in short supply, 
Blumen did advise Rizal on a legal way to end his exile. Hence, Rizal wrote to Governor General Ramon Blanco. On July 30, 1896, Rizal received a letter from the Governor General accepting his offer to volunteer as a doctor. The letter also included a request to the politico-military commander of the Pitan to grant Rizal a pass to return to Manila. Jose Rizal was supposed to be transported from Manila to a steamer heading for Spain and finally Cuba. However, shortly after his departure, the Katipunan, a successor to La Liga Filipina, whose methods Rizal rejected, launched an insurgency. Moisa Salvador stated that Rizal told them in the meeting to organize an association to be called La Liga Filipina, whose object and end would be to obtain the separation of the Philippines from the Spanish nation. On the other hand, Rizal sailed for Spain bearing letters of recommendation from Governor General Blanco. However, when the steamer reached Singapore, Pedro Rojas urged Rizal to desert the ship. But Rizal said that such an act would be considered a confession of guilt. Rizal would do nothing that suggested an uneasy conscience despite his lack of confidence in Spanish justice. He was subsequently arrested and put on a ship bound for Manila. The Spanish authorities unjustly blamed Rizal for the uprising and arrested him. Rizal was charged with rebellion and founding an illegal society after his return to Manila. Witnesses attested to his connection with the rebels and he was condemned by a military court. Sa yugtong ito, ating tatalakayin ang mga sumusunod na pangyayari sa buhay ni Jose Rizal. Una, ang kanyang pagkaaresto. Pangalawa, ang pagpapatapon sa kanya sa dapitan at sa huli, ang mga sandali ni Rizal sa Fort Santiago. Noong huling nag-usap si Rizal at si Gobernur General Despujol, ipinahayag ng Gobernur General na may mga handbills or leaflets na subersibo o salungat sa mga paniniwala ng mga praile na natagpuan sa mga bagahe ni Rizal galing sa Hong Kong. Ang paratang na ito ay higit na itinanggi ni Rizal. Ang kanyang mga kapatid ng babae ang nag-ipake ng kanyang mga kagamitan, ngunit hindi niya lubos maisip na magkakamali ang mga ito dahil marigit limang taon na silang nag-iingat upang hindi humantong sa ganitong sitwasyon. Napagtanto ni Rizal, na ito ay kagagagawa ng mga praile kung saan sadyang tinamnan ng subversibong handbills ang kanyang kagamitan. Si Rizal ay mahinahong inaresto. Siya ay hindi minaltrato at pinagbuhatan ng kamay. Pagdating niya sa bilangguan, bumungad kay Rizal ang malawak na kwarto at disyente ang mobles. Siya ay binigyan rin ng mga aklat na maaari ng basahin habang nasa kulungan. Subalit, sa kabila nito, si Rizal ay pinagbawalang magsulat at kung ang mga gwardiya sibil ay may mahukuling sino mang susubok na kausap si Rizal mula sa baybayin, ang mga gwardiya ay hindi magdadalawang isip na pumaslang. So while this entire event transpired, Gobernur General Despujol is torn between several groups, mainly the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, and the interests of the government of Spain. Hindi man ikakailang sadyang mapanukso ang mga pagpuna ni Rizal sa mga praile. Kaya naman, walang nais ang mga ito kundi tuluyang patahimikin si Rizal. Subalit, ang mga Jesuits ay mayroong lihim na mas Madiskarteng plano. So the superior of the Jesuits at this point in time was no other than Pablo Pastels. Si Pastels ay noong itinuring at inilarawan ni Rizal bilang pinakakilala at ang may pinakamaraming nilakbay bilang isang hiswitang misyonaryo. Si Pastels naman ay aminadong mas malaking panalo at kalamangan ng simbahan kung maibabalik nila si Rizal sa pananampalataya lalo na sa Ateneo nag-aral si Rizal. Kung matagumpay ang plano, may posibilidad na babawi ni Rizal ang lahat ng kanyang pagpunalaban sa simbahan at kung magkataon ay ito'y magsusulat pabor sa interes ng mga praile. Si Pastels ay hindi nag-aksaya ng oras at iminungkahi kay Disbohol na si Rizal ay patapon sa malayong hiswitang simbahan kung saan Jesuit's priest would undertake the task of bringing about Rizal's retraction. Ang gobernor general ay hindi nag-alinlangang tanggapin ang ideya ni Pastels lalo na siya ay pabor sa mga katolikong praile. At sa huli, ang karera ni Rizal sa politika ay nagtapos noong siya ay dumating sa dapitan. Kaakibat din ito ang pagtatapos ng La Liga Filipina. Dahil wala na siya bilang kaligi ng organisasyon, 
unti itong huminto sa pagiging aktibo. Ngunit sa gabi ng paglunsad ng La Liga Filipina, isa sa mga dumalo ay walang iba kundi si Andres Bonifacio na siyang pinukaw ng El Filipostirismo. Noong inanunsyo ang pagpapatapon kay Rizal sa malayong lugar, si Bonifacio at anim ng mga kasamahan ay bumuo ng organisasyong tungo sa pakikibaka at armadong revolusyon na kung tawagin ay kataas-taasang kagalang-galangang katipunan ng mga anak ng bayan. To quote Austin Coates, the revolution which Rizal had inspired, which he had postulated, in which he was to play no part, but which he was to die for, was underway. Rizal arrived in the Britain on the 17th of July, 1892. Pagbaba niya sa barkong Cebu, siya ay sinalubong ng komandante at priling Jesuita. Siya ay binigyan ng karapatang pumili kung saan siya maninirahan sa bahay ng komandante Kapitan Ricardo Carcinero o sa kumbento ni Padre Antonio Obak. Bago po man makapag si Rizal, agad naman siyang pinaalam ng prile na makakatira lamang siya sa kumbento sa kondisyong babawiin niya lahat na kanyang mga pagpunalaban sa mga prile at magbalik loob sa simbahan. Dahil sa kondisyong ito, hindi nag-alinlangan si Rizal na pansamantalang manirahan sa bahay ni Carcinero. Gayun pa man, tuloy pa rin ang pangungbinsi ng mga hiswita kay Rizal na alinsunod sa utos ni Pastels. At dahil alam niyang hindi pasapat si Padre Obak, may nabuti niyang ipadala si Padre Sanchez sa dapitan. Noong nag-aaral pa si Rizal sa Ateneo, si Padre Sanchez ang isa sa kanyang mga guro. Kaya naman, tiwala si Pastels na magwawagi sila sa huli. Ngunit kasanungat ng kanilang inaasahan, bigo pa rin si Padre Sanchez. So ang resisyon ni Rizal na manirahan sa bahay ni Carcinero ay nagbunga ng hindi inasahang pagkakaibigan. Napagtanto rin nilang pareho na sila ay mahilig sa paglalaro ng loto at noong si Rizal ay tinamaan ng swerte, siya ay nakabili ng isang magandang lupa malapit sa baybay na kung tawagin ay talisay. Ginamit ni Rizal ang kanyang kaalaman sa agrikultura upang palaguin ang lupa. Ito ang pinagkaaliwan ni Rizal upang maiwaksi ang lungkot na nararamdaman. Hindi nagtagal lumago ang kanyang pinaghirapan at nabuo na rin ang ipinatayong bahay ni Rizal na kanyang ginamit bilang ospital at pansamantalang paaralan. Dito rin siya nagsimulang tumanggap ng mga pasyente at kung saan din siya nagturo ng mga batang lalaki. Ang nalikom na pera mula sa kanyang mga produkto ay ginawa niyang puhunan upang masustentuhan ang kanyang pagamutan at paaralan. Magamat maraming pinagkakabalahan si Rizal sa dapitan, hindi maikakailang unti-unti na siyang nangihina dulot sa kanyang pag-iisa. Sa puntong ito, malapit na siyang mawala ng pag-asa at nang biglang masulipan niya si Josephine Bracken. So si Bracken ang ampung anak ni James Tuffer at ang kanyang kinakasama na si Manuela Orlock. Sa pag-aakala ng marami, si Bracken ay isang Irish. Ngunit lingit sa kanilang kaalaman, si Bracken ay ilihitimong anak ng isang banyag ng taga-Europa at inang isang Asyano mula sa Hong Kong. Simula nung pinagtagpo ng tadhana si Rizal at Bracken, tuluyan na silang nahulog sa isa't isa. Gayunpaman, maraming hadlang sa pag-iibigan ng dalawa. Sila ay naninirahan sa dapitan bilang mag-asawa kahit hindi sila kasal sa ng simpahan. Kalaunan ay nagdalang tao si Bracken at sa hindi inasang pagkakataon, kinalangan niyang mga anak ng hindi, ng hindi sa tamang oras at ang sanay magiging unang anak na lalaki ni Rizal ay namatay. Dahil sa pangyayaring ito, lugmok na lugmok si Rizal at tila ba ito ay nagbago ng pananaw sa buhay. On February 1895, nagsimula na ang revolusyon sa Cuba. Kasama na rin ito ang epidemya ng Yellow Fever. Sa huling banda ng taon, iminungkahay ni Blumentritt na umap- umapila si Rizal sa Espanya at ipadala ito sa Cuba bilang isang doktor ng mga militar at katulad ng dati, wala pa rin sagot mula sa pamahalaan. Noong petsa uno ng Hulyo of 1896, may dumating na in- hindi inasang bisita si Rizal sa pagngangalang Dr. Pio Valenzuela. Ayon sa kanyang pagpapakilala, siya ay matapat na kaibigan at kasamahan ni Andres Bonifacio. Ipinahayag ni Valenzuela kay Rizal ang plano ng mga katiponeros. Ngunit sa halip na sumang-ayon, si Rizal ay tutul sa pag-aaklas. Ano nito ay kulang pa ang mga kagamitan, panggastos at wala pa sa kanilang panig ang buong suporta ng mga influential na pamilya sa Pilipinas. In quotes words, His assessment of it was that Bonifacio was leading people into a suicidal exploit. Kahit ano pa ang sabihin ni Rizal, hindi na niya mapipigilan ang revolusyon kaya naman iminungkahin niya kay Valenzuela na lumapit kay Anthony Luna dahil siya ay may kaalaman sa pag-organisa ng mga misyong pang-militar. Ngunit sa huli, si Luna ay hindi din pumayag citing the same reasons as Rizal. 
By July 30, he did not expect to receive a letter informing him that his re request to be deployed in Cuba has been granted. Mentally, Rizal has already moved on from it, but since the option was already there, Rizal wasted no time to pack, sell his properties, and distributed his assets among his followers. As Rizal departed the Pitan to Cuba, his evident death was the last thing he expected. After Spain turned down Rizal's offer, he was seized in Barcelona on the 6th of October 1896 and was quickly deported back to the Philippines, after which he was brought to Fort Santiago and he was detained. Rizal was then on trial for 56 days, and by December 29, he was sentenced to death and was set to be executed the very next day. In the day of Rizal's execution, before he was supposed to be eliminated by a firing squad, he was given the opportunity to meet with his mother. He asked for forgiveness and expressed his grief for all the heartaches he caused her. Apart from that, one unverified information in Rizal's life story remains debatable among historians and scholars. That, allegedly, Rizal wrote a retraction letter. Accordingly, the said retraction letter contains Rizal's changed views towards the church. As a strong critic of the dom dominating religion as a Freemason himself, it was almost unbelievable and beyond reason. Such action was unlikely of Rizal's character. To quote, the letter contains the following statement in English. I retract with all my heart whatever in my words, writings, publications, and conduct have been contrary to my character as a son of a Catholic Church. Due to this, experts have been divided. A few believe that this is some pious fraud or blatant forgery, pointing that the letter found did not have Rizal's handwriting, nor did it reflect Rizal's character and firm beliefs. Among those who deny the legitimacy of the retraction letter are prominent academicians such as Ricardo Pascual, former Senator Rafael Palma, Frank Lobach, Austin Coates, and Ricardo Manapat. Conversely, there are also those who have conceded and affirmed that the retraction letter of Rizal was in fact real and authentic. Contrary to circumstances, Substantial evidence, historians, back and witnesses that have seen Rizal when he penned the retraction letter. Nick Joaquin, Nicolas Zafra, Leon Marrera. Leon Maria, Maria Guerrero and Beth Acampo, among others, acknowledged and accepted Rizal's retraction letter and collectively agreeing that this is just another fact of history, that opposition of such is merely stubbornness of some Masons. In addition, the aforementioned historians also refer to the many witnesses that were present when Rizal wrote the retraction letter, signed a Catholic prayer book, recited Catholic prayers, and even kissed a Catholic cross before he was executed. Furthermore, a great grand nephew of Rizal in the name of Father Marciano Guzman confirmed that there were several witnesses which include but are not limited to newspaper representatives, historians, writers, as well as Spanish Supreme Court head who was highly respected by Rizal himself due to former's integrity. And with this development, the weight of the pieces of evidence that Rizal's retraction letter is legitimate speaks volumes of the truth. However, Rizal's retraction letter does not diminish his greatness as a Filipino who sacrificed and fought for what we know today as Philippine independence. Regardless of Re Rizal's religious beliefs, his works are timeless and irrevocably instruments that championed our way to national identity. If anything, Rizal's retraction simply proves that, until his last breath, change is still possible, if and only if one has courage to do so. On December 30, 1896, Dr. Jose Rizal was convicted of sedition, igniting a rebellion. He was executed by a firing squad at the Bagumbayan Field in Manila. His body disposed and buried with no casket, no name. If Rizal's death meant liberating the Filipinos, then so be it.